If you have your Bibles or whatever tonight, I want you to turn me, please, very quickly to 2 Kings chapter 7. 2 Kings in chapter 7. 2 Kings chapter 7. I, I want to read nine verses to you. I'll try to get through this pretty quickly, but this is really something that's been on my heart strongly, and so I, I don't want to rush the Spirit of God. I, I know that God has been speaking to my heart out of this passage for some time, and I trust He will to you tonight. This is a great passage in the Word of God, 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 1 through verse 9. There's a famine going on in the city of Samaria, and the Syrian army had, had encamped all around the city and cut off all supplies in and out, and right outside the entering of the gate, there were four leprous men. 2 Kings 7, 1. Then Elisha said, hear, hear ye the word of the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold and a shekel, of two, uh, and, a shekel and two measures of valley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. In other words, he said, tomorrow the famine's going to be over. God's going to do something. Then the Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? Keep questioning the man of God. This was a cynic. This was a, a critical person. A person was a naysayer. And he said, the prophet said, Behold, you'll see it with your eyes, but not, you'll not eat thereof. And there were four leprous men at the entering into the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here till we die? If we say we enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but die. And they arose in the twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made a host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, <clears throat> Alo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the king of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp and went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it. And came again into, an, into, into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. Then they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tear till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. Father, I pray in Jesus' name the Holy Spirit of God will just bless this word and bless our hearts and open our understanding. And for that which you do, we'll give you all the praise and glory and honor for it. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Here's a great story in the Word of God about a city that was taken by famine. And the Syrian army who wanted to inhabit the city had cut off all the supplies going in. Nobody could leave. And right outside those gates of that city were four leprous men sitting there dying. They knew they couldn't go into the city because they'd die there. And they, they, they couldn't sit still where they were. They knew they'd die doing that. And... So they said to themselves one day, why should we here till we die? There's only one possibility that, that we'll survive, and that's to get up and go toward the camp of the Syrian army. And so the Word of God says one day after they asked themselves that question, that question obviously changed their life. And they got up by faith and headed toward the camp of the Syrian army, and God went before them and made the enemy to hear a noise, a great host. And when they heard that noise... It caused such panic in them, they ran for their life. They left everything like it was, the tents, the horses, all their livestock, all the food, everything. They left it just as it was and fled for their life. Noise from another world will strike fear and terror or joy in your heart. It just depends on whose side you're on. They weren't on God's side, and so God sent noise from another world. These men were in extreme opposition. And much of the time in our life, we face extreme opposition against our life, especially in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's opposition all around. It hasn't stopped. It hasn't stayed. It seems like in our day and time, it's even increasing and getting worse, the opposition against the gospel in the church of the living God. But man's extremities are God's opportunities. Man needed a miracle. These four lepers needed a miracle. But God needed four lepers 
men. St. Augustine, I believe, has rightly said, without God I cannot, but without me God will not. God still uses human instrumentality. As Mike drove me around the campuses today, I, I saw how God is using you at First Baptist Church. God still uses human instrumentality. Could God do it without us? Well, he chooses not to. He chooses to use you and me and the vessels that we are. The four leprous men are representative, I believe, of a fallen world, fallen men, fallen women, uh, insecure and, and full of fear, crippled by the fall and full of our doubts and insecurities. All of us are and all of us have that, our failures in life and our insecurities in life. And so these four leprous men, I believe, represent you and me. The Syrian army represents every opposition to the gospel, every opposition to the church of the living God, and Samaria represents a world starving and in need of Jesus Christ. My dear friend, the answer is still the same for the world. The answer is still the same for lost men. The answer is still the same, and we have the answer in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the world, I believe, is still starving for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, these men were opposed by the army. They were opposed by the people in the city but they were opposing themselves. So one day they got up and headed toward the enemy's camp. I remember singing when we were traveling years ago a little song that I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. And so many people in the family of God have allowed the enemy to steal dreams from them and steal futures from them and steal their marriage from them and steal love from them and steal things from them. And I believe it's time the church of the living God empowered by the Holy Spirit of God got a good dose of being filled with the Spirit of God and went to the enemy's camp and started taking back everything that he tried to take from you and I, everything he tries to steal from you and from me. There's a question here that demanded an answer, a question that demands, why should we here till we die? I'm 75 years old, and I, I promise you, I, I'm asking God day by day by day to give me strength and energy. I claim the verse for me that God, the Holy Spirit, is a quickening spirit to quicken our mortal bodies I want my mortal body and my mind and my spirit and my heart quickened for the kingdom of God until the day I finally pass from this life. Why? I don't want to sit still and die. I don't want the enemy take anything more from me. I've been robbed enough. He's taken enough. He's stolen enough. And I've allowed him to do it when I was a younger preacher. And by God's grace today, I will not, by God's grace, allow him to take any more from my life, any more from my ministry, any more from my family, any more from my future, any more from what God has for us as the people of God. You are a great church and a great people. And after I share with Mike today and Mike share with me today all that's going on in your church, I'm, I'm thinking, God, these, these are a great people. And you're a great church and you're a great givers. And you have a great pastor with a great vision and a great choir. And, 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 and everything that is going on at First Baptist is really awesome. And I, I see that and, and I'm thinking, God, they, they are wonderful people, a great people. But I want you to know, my dear friend, we don't need to be just a great people, but a guarded people. Because Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He'll try to destroy and devour this church and destroy and divide this ministry and take from this church and your future everything that God has for you. What, what, what's the response to extreme opposition? What, what's the response when the enemy comes against us? What's the response when we see ourselves as four leprous men? Well, we can maximize it. We can, we can, we can feel like we are, we are overcome by the enemy, that we can't do anything right. We, we can feel like we failed too many times. We can feel like we're never going to get there. We, we can listen to the enemy's lies and and Paul the Apostle warned us about vain imagination. Vain imagination. And vain imagination is when I allow in my thinking the enemy to create any scenario that's greater than God's ability to solve. When I allow the enemy to create in my thinking any scenario greater than the enemy's, than God's ability to solve. So here's my question. Is there anything too great for God? Is there anything that God can't do? And my dear friend, greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. We are on the winning side as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We can maximize it. We can minimize it. I think that's what we do. I think we marginalize the enemy's ability. I think for so long we're in church and we're doing good and we've got a wonderful people and we marginalize the enemy's capacity. He's been at this a long time. One Puritan talked about 
Sometimes men are dumber than animals. He said when a man traps an animal for a living, after that animal has been ensnared in that trap, he'll scald that trap thoroughly clean of all the blood, hair, and the scent. Because if he doesn't, no animal will go near that trap when he resets it. Why? Because they have a sense that something died there. And that Puritan said, Satan's been laying the same traps from the beginning of time. And there's teeth, hair, blood, eyeballs, limbs, ministries, marriages, futures, children, laying all around. And we keep walking in the same trap time and time again. Why? Because we're not on guard. We're not vigilant. We're not sober. We're not doing what we should do as the people of God. We're, we're, we're at ease in Zion and we should be taking things for the kingdom of God, advancing for the kingdom of God and making a difference even in this community. You say, Brother Paul, look how much we've done. Well, pin a rose on your nose. You, you can do more and you can be more and there's a lot more to be done. I want you to know something. There's lost people all around this community, people in need of restoration, people in need of Jesus, and you are the answer, my dear friend. You don't just have the answer. You are the answer as the church of the living God. But unless we get out in the highways and byways and do something about it, you can maximize, you can minimize, you can advertise it. Advertise your challenge. Advertise your trouble. Advertise your struggle. Oh, me, oh, my. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going out in the garden pick worms. First, I'll eat the skinny ones, then I'll eat the fat ones, then I'll bite their heads off, then I'll suck their guts out. What are you talking about? We feel sorry for ourselves and a pity party for ourselves. I love those. I love that famous singing group, that spiritual singing group, the Eagles. <laughs> they, they, they have a great song, and here's one of the lines. I turn on the tube, and what do I see? A whole lot of people crying, don't blame me. They point the crooked little finger at everybody else, Spend all their time feeling sorry for themselves. Victim of this, victim of that. Your mama's too thin, your daddy's too fat. Get over it, get over it. Are you whining and crying and pitching a fit? Get over it, get over it. Get over it. I want you to know something. We have a pity party for ourselves. While the world's out there without Christ, we're these four leprous men. There's people starving to death, people hurting, marriages devastated, lives devastated. My dear brother and sister, we don't just have the answer. We are the answer as the kingdom of God and the people empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. So don't maximize it, don't minimize it, don't advertise it, don't analyze it. Don't analyze it. These four lepers men sitting there thinking, I, I know they were thinking, we can't go in the city, we're going to die. We can't sit still here, we're going to die. Only chance we have is go toward the camp of the Syrian army. If they save us, we'll, we'll live, and if they don't, we'll die. So what, we're going to die anyway? When I was in the Marine Corps, I uh, was assigned to, well, I didn't sign, I volunteered for a recon outfit during Vietnam. And uh, I, 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 we had, like, I had like 38 guerrilla warfare courses during that time. And I remember one of the drill instructors during one of those guerrilla warfare courses, uh, we, we, were, we were in a no-win scenario. It, it was a, there was no win, you, you couldn't win. You know, you couldn't stay where you were. You couldn't advance toward the enemy. It was a no-win scenario. And so he asked us all, what are you going to do? And we sat there sucking our thumbs. We sat there analyzing the situation. We, we sat there kind of kind of like those two theologians that, that, that were splitting that theological hair while people were going over the precipice into hell for eternity. And we analyzed the thing to death. Finally, he stopped and he shouted, do something. Do something. Hey, listen, friend. Is your marriage in trouble? Do something. Is your faith ebbing low? Do something. My God, do something. Don't just sit there and die. Get up and do something. I don't care what it is. Just do something. You got a pastor that will lead you. You got a pastor that has a heart for Christ. You have a pastor that has no backup in him. He doesn't even know where reverse is. I've been with him for a day and a half. He doesn't have any reverse. Well, what do you do? What do you do when opposition comes? What do you do when the pastor throws out a vision that's greater than our ability? You know what our problem is? We don't need miracles. We got money. We got seats, we got comfort, we're in our 70s. <laughs> and I'm 
So what? I want to be like, I want to be like Caleb when I'm 85 and say, God, you see that mountain? It belongs to me. Hallelujah. And I'll give it to you that pastor will be the very same way when he's 85 years of age. Well, what do you do when opposition comes? What do you do when extreme opposition comes? I think the first thing you got to do is adopt a fighting spirit. You got to fight. Got to fight. Hey, listen, the Bible says fight the good fight of the faith. N not faith, but the faith. I mean, there's a struggle, there's fight, there's opposition to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul's talking about. Fight the good fight of the faith. Hey, listen, friend, God tells us the kingdom of God suffers violence, but the violent take it by force. Amen. Amen. We need some warrior men and warrior women that will stand up and fight for what's right. Friend, there's opposition to the gospel. The world still hates Jesus, and if they hate Jesus, they're going to hate you and hate me. I love singing, I love preaching, I love being nice, most of the time. <laughs> but we can sing and preach and be nice as we want to be, but the flesh opposes the gospel, the world opposes the gospel, and that's the one thing this church is about. You've got to adopt a fighting spirit. Take on you the whole armor of God. we got a younger generation I preach to all the time. And I talked about the armor of God not too long ago. The whole armor, helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the gospel of peace, shield of faith, sword of the spirit, the word of God. And I said, you get on the armor and then you sit down at night with the armor of God on, playing Nintendo. <laughs> Boy, you making a difference. Boy, you killing demons for sure. <laughs> you put on armor for a reason. You put on armor to go to war. You put on armor to fight. You put on armor to oppose the enemy. And God knows you need armor. And that's why he gave it to us. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's not to be a pew potato. It's not to be a couch potato watching your favorite soap opera all day long. I got armor on. <laughs> so what? You say, Brother Paul, you don't realize I'm drawing Social Security. <laughs> so am I. I didn't even know I had it. <laughs> I opted out so long ago, I didn't even know I had it. And one day they called me and said, you're 70 years old, five years old. You're going to take this any time? And I said, how much is it? They told me, I said, yeah, send it on. <laughs> We're not done. God's not through with us. We have mountains to climb, rivers to cross. We have work to do for the kingdom of God. Every one of us do. And you're making a difference with the leadership of this man of God and this church. Amen. Yeah. Adopt a fighting spirit. Head toward your enemy. Advance toward your enemy. Do you know all your enemies are nothing but are bullies and cowards? Bullies and cowards. And when you head toward them, they run like the bullies they are. How was the... I hesitate to tell you this because I just hesitate to tell you, but I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> About five weeks ago, I was in Portland, Oregon, preaching at the convention center. Before that, we were down at the resort in the mountains and about 300 of the top leaders. And I was speaking every night to them and ministering down there. And, 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 and one day, I was, I, I, I was at the clubhouse, golf course, clubhouse, and no car was there. Billy had gone. And so I wanted to walk back to the house I'd rented on the golf course. And I'd rented this really nice place. And this one of my dearest friends in the world was a Navy SEAL, ex-Navy SEAL, former Navy SEAL. And he and I are just kind of like compadres at arms. And they come to our house every Christmas. And, and I'd rented a house in Franklin Lynn. And Billy and I and, and myself and Gretchen and Mark were staying there. Well, I started walking back toward the house about a mile and a half. And, and I was on the road, and all of a sudden, I decided to get on the golf cart path and walk because it was shorter. So I'm walking up the golf cart path and minding my own business, and I stopped and let them tee off. Mike, I just didn't interfere. Let them tee off, and they'd tee off, and, and then I'd walk behind them. I came up on this turn where our place was right down here that we'd rented, and I came on this turn, and, and this big old boy, about six foot four, 40 years old, was standing there, and, and two older men about my age in the golf cart looked like really nice men. 
And this guy, 40 years old, big six foot four, turned around and said, hey. I said, you talking to me? <laughs> he said, yeah, hey. I said, yes, sir. He said, you're trespassing. This is private property. And I said, well, look, I just rented a place right down the road here. I just, I just, it's right down here. It's just about 100 yards down here. I'm, I'm waiting for you guys to tee off. I'm not bothering you. He said, hey, this is private property. You're trespassing. I said, okay, but I'm not bothering you. I, I, we played golf here twice yesterday. And he said, hey, this is private property, and you're trespassing. <laughs> I said, really? I had a Marine Corps jacket on. I took my Marine Corps jacket off. I had flip-flops. I flipped them off, and I walked up to him, and I got in his face. And I said, let me ask you a question. Who's going to throw me off this course? I'm 75. I'm fishing to get my butt whipped. 75. I said, who's going to throw me? He said, are you a bad? I said, I'm a bad, bad. Yes, I am. <laughs> he got, he sat back down in his golf cart. <laughs> Honest to God, sat back down in his golf cart. And I waited until he teed off and went back to the house. I was sitting outside with Frank, Navy SEAL. And about 20 minutes later, this guy comes by in the golf cart, just running by in the golf cart. He, he said, hey, you give the Marine Corps a bad name. <laughs> Coward, bully. Every time you face a bully, they'll back down. But you got to be willing to get whipped a time or two. Amen. <laughs> but God's not looking you over for medals when you get to heaven. He's looking you over for battle scars. Praise God. We're in a battle. We're in a war. We're in a fight. We're in a struggle. You got to adopt the fighting spirit. Be willing to face the enemy and shut him down. Why? Because God is going to perform a miracle. Advance toward the enemy. Know without God you're sunk. Every prison door has a, every prison has a door out. Every river has a bridge over it. Every mountain has a talent through it. Every famine has a provision somewhere. Every lost person has a hero. Every story has a, every story has a hero. And mine is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. We're, 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 we're in this big political climate today. PC. Well, Brother Paul, you don't realize North Carolina here, we're all real conservative. So what? So what? The battle that we're in is not going to be won in Washington, D.C. The battle that we're in isn't about political party, it's about political systems. In the about behavior modification, but Holy Ghost transformation by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the battle is going to be won. You can get upset all you want to get upset, but I'll tell you, we think that so-and-so gets an office, it's going to be the answer. No, it's not. The kingdoms of this world are crumbling, and they will ultimately crumble. The kingdoms of this world are opposed by the kingdom of God. I am a veteran of the Marine Corps for five years. I love this country. I'd bleed red, white, and blue, but I serve a country greater than this country. I serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. His name is El Shaddai. Hallelujah. And we need to be so fired up in our living and fired up in our giving and fired up in our witness. We realize, hallelujah, we are on the winning side. Glory to God. These four lepers men rose by faith. And this Syrian army heard a noise of a great host, and they fled for their life. But when these four lepers men came and found nobody at the camp, here's what they did. What we do oftentimes, they went into one tent, didn't eat and drink and carried them silver and gold and raiment, went and hid it. Went into another tent and carried them silver and gold and raiment, went and hid it. Went into another tent and carried them silver and gold and raiment, went and hid it. And came and ate and were filled. Came and ate and were fed. Came and ate and were blessed. That's what we do Sunday after Sunday, week after week. We come, we're filled, we're blessed. We're encouraged, we're empowered. And they sat there consuming all these good things on themselves. We are the most self-centered, self-consumed, selfish people in the world. Picking fuzz out of our navel. Yeah, woo, woo, woo. 
me, my, I. I love you people. I'm not, a, I'm not angry with you people. I'm not. I'm just saying there's a charge for the church of the living God. We come week after week after week after week. We get blessed. We get encouraged. We get saved. We get filled. We get restored. We get forgiven over and over again. But what are we doing with it? Where's the older men discipling the younger men? Where's the older women discipling the younger women? Where's the church of the living God being the church of the living God? You're filled with the Spirit of God. You're anointed. You're, 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 you're ordained. He said, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. And, and, and I've ordained you that you should go and bear fruit, and your fruit should remain. So one day these guys, full of themselves, full of the goods they had, full of the food that was in the camp of the Syrian army, one day they sat there and they said, we do not well. Procrastination is suicide on the installment plans. We procrastinate, hesitate, deliberate. We're an army. We should be militant about the things of God, the gospel, our living, our giving. Been there, done that. Been there, done that, where I stood up to preach because I wanted to be heard. Not because I wanted to help anybody, but I wanted to be heard. I'm sure you girls have been there a time or two in ministry traveling that you have. It's all about me, all about me, all about me. I didn't stand to preach to help anybody. I, t- I stood to preach to be heard, to be seen, to get what I could get. And God changed my life in my own failure. In my failure in the mid-80s and left the ministry voluntarily. God, the Holy Ghost changed my life, changed my ministry. I was saved. I was born again, but I didn't understand what the kingdom of God was about. I, I came from the sewer. I came from the gutter. I was full of hate and bitterness. My father gave me two whippings when I was a kid and put me in the hospital both times. I didn't know what love was all about. I got saved. I know I got forgiven of my sins. But I was so full of myself, finally like these leprous men, I came to myself and said, I'm not doing what's right. And while the decision changed their life, the decision they made to go back to the, to the, to the city of Samaria and tell them the famine's over, the famine's done, the famine's history, there's food for everyone, that decision ended the famine. It, 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 it changed their life and changed the life of others. Can I ask you something? What's it going to take to unlock our compassion? What's it going to take for me to understand as a 75-year-old man, I own nothing. And without him, I would be nothing. And without him, I could do nothing. What's it going to take me to understand that everything God has blessed me with, everything God has given to us, everything God has allowed us to be stewards over is His, only His. I have a dear friend of mine who's got leaving behind about a $12 million inheritance for a son who's as wicked and godless as he can be. I asked him one day, why? Why would you do that? Why would you leave a man everything that's gonna, just going to waste it on this world? Why would you do that instead of invest it in the kingdom of God? You can be part of the provision. You can be part of the problem. They, they said, if we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. I love that. We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings for us. And if we hold our peace, if we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. They're, they're now therefore come, let us go and tell the king's household that there's good news, good news, good news. You, 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 you know what gets us in more trouble than anything else? Tarrying. Tarrying. When God says move, we move. When the pastor says that's the way, walk in it, we walk in it. 
When, when, when God gives us direction, we, we by faith, we get up. We're, we're people of faith. We're people that's been born again. We're, we're going, we're, these girls sing about it tonight. All these girls say about it tonight. We're going to, to a land that is fairer than day. Beulah land. We're going. We're headed there. You say, Brother Paul, you keep preaching like that, you're going to have a heart attack. Well, I already had one two years ago. I'm ready for another one. Amen. <laughs> but every two years, I need a little renewal. I don't care. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want to go, I want, I want to go, I want to go out standing, I want to go down standing up, I want to go out serving Christ, making a difference, and I know we can be part of the provision, a part of the problem, we can be part of the opportunity, a part of the opposition. As I said earlier, we don't just have the answer, we can be the answers for those people around us by our living, by our giving. You've done that. I know you've done that. All I'm saying to you, I'm not saying you haven't, I'm not, I'm not saying you haven't been wonderful, I'm just saying there's so much more there's so much more. You say, well, we've got a recreation field now. We've got a school now. We've got, uh, okay, okay, but there's more. Why don't you buy Charlotte? <laughs> there's more. If he has anything to do with it, he's, he'll, he'll make a payment on it. There's more. Oh, I, 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 got, on, I got on the uh, live stream deal, and I, I listened to every preacher that you had here over the last month. Johnny Hunt's one of my favorite people in the world. I love Johnny Hunt all my heart. I listen to every preacher. And, and, and you know what? I was convicted by the Spirit of God because you know what these men were saying? Every one of them to me, there's more. Uh, that we're, we're this age or that age, but there's more. There's still more ahead of us. And now you know, friend, God has work for you. And God, you know the guy, you know the guy that said, okay, the, 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 might this thing be if God wanted to do it? What happened is when the wagon started coming into the city, he was standing there counting the wagons, and the wagons ran over him and killed him. <laughs> I love that. Oh, I love that. I can't help it. I love it. I love it. I love that part in Jeremiah when Jeremiah grabbed those unbelievers and smote them and smote them and smote them until they got right with God. I like that kind of stuff. <laughs> Believers see it, enjoy it, and pass it on. And only those who risk going too far can possibly find out how far they can go. There's a story that I read a while back about a town in southwest Turkey. And the, the, the officials of that country came to them and said, you, you have built your city over a fault line and it's inedible that an earthquake's going to come by and destroy the city. So the town fathers got together and here's what they said. It's too expensive to move the city, too costly, and it's too inconvenient to move the whole city. The, the government officials came back and said, hey, it's only a matter of time. It's, 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 the city's going to be destroyed. You built over a fault line. And they said, look, we got it. But it's too costly, too inconvenient. So they came up with an ingenious plan. Well, it was ingenious. The town fathers got together, took out the map, looked at the fault line, and they moved the fault line 100 miles to the east on the map. <laughs> hey, we keep redrawing that fault line. You know why? Because, because we got hope in this system and hope in that system and hope in this person and hope in that person and hope in this party and hope in that party. When, when are we going to learn our hopes in God? And we shall yet praise him. Our hopes in God. He's our rock. He's our shield. He's our comforter. Some men trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the Lord our God and what he has done for us. The provision's here. The provision's here. The provision is here. And you know where it begins? At the cross. Where the world was crucified unto me and me unto the world. Uh, one more story. I'll, I'll be finished. I'm wrapping up. I read about these greyhound dogs that, you know, run around the track and, and you bet on them. You've heard of them, Mike? How come you've heard of them? <laughs> Educated man. And, and these greyhound dogs have been retired to, 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 to a beautiful meadow out south of London. They were too old to run anymore. They couldn't do that. And so they were retired to this beautiful meadow. And they chased this mechanical rabbit around the track 
for years and years and years, but now they're retired. Whew. So they sit out there, they just lay out there every day, and they just kind of lay out there, just kind of snoozing every day. Every once in a while, a real life rabbit would get up and run across their path, and they'd just go, You know why? They've been chasing the artificial and the superficial for so long, they didn't recognize the real thing when it comes by. <laughs> we need, I was praying tonight, girls in choir, Matt, when you were singing, you know what we need? I used to pray this all the time in our revived meetings. We need the breath of God. We need the wind of God. We need the Holy Ghost of God to come upon us again. We really do. You, you, you say, what's that going to do? It's going to make you what you should be. I mean, what's it going to do? Don't be afraid. Say, if I, boy, if, I, if the Holy Ghost comes on me, I don't tell him what I'll do. Well, you ain't going to get crazier than me. <laughs> Alvin, we need that fresh anointing of the Spirit of God. That fresh outpouring of the Spirit of God. No matter how much we've done, no matter how far we've come, no matter, it doesn't matter. Tonight when they were singing all this crusade, you know what I thought about? I want to get up and sing. I can't sing, but I wanted to get up and sing. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Hey, you know what? I remember 1971 on the gutter, in the gutter of the main street of Victoria, Texas. I remember when the Spirit of God came on me. I remember when a Baptist preacher told me about Jesus, how much he loved me. I remember a black woman walking by and saying, save him, Lord Jesus, save him. And she's the only one that knew what was going on. I remember that. I remember my failure in the mid-80s after serving Christ and preaching revival meetings all over the country 15 years or so. I, and I remember getting full of myself and making wrong choices and giving into my flesh and giving place to the devil and loving the world. I remember. I remember. Say, our God's a God of a second chance. No, sir, he's a God of another chance and another and another and another. And another, and another. I remember. I remember when preachers wouldn't talk to me and wouldn't have me, and this one did. Amen. I remember. Amen. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. You remember? You remember how you felt? Remember what God did for you? Remember that, like, lifted off you? Rolled away. It was there by faith. I, I, I kept thinking, God, how are you going to live in me? How are you going to live in me? I mean, I know I've got an awesome body. I mean, I got me. <laughs> but how are you going to live in me? Everybody's got a thorn in the flesh. Mine is God be this good looking the rest of my life. I can't help it. <laughs> Do you remember what it felt like when Jesus saved you? Remember what it felt like when he came? Remember what you wanted to tell everybody? You wanted to give everything you had. You wanted to do anything you could do to rescue your neighbor and rescue your relatives and rescue. You remember what that felt like? All these men that's preached all week long, the great choirs that sung and the great singers you've had in, every one of them had the same message. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. God, I was blinded. I was dead. I, all of a sudden, I, 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 when I got saved, I went, Wow! It's like, like Matrix. I, wow! And the burden of my heart rolled away. It really did. You know why? Because I, I thought about nothing but my sin being rolled away. Uh, you know, how, how good and pleasant any man knows that his sin's been rolled away by Jesus. And we dwell together in unity. And I, I realized there was unity in the body of Christ. People started calling me brother. <laughs> Before they called me inmate. <laughs> Brother. It was there by faith. I received my sight. And now I am happy. I didn't say there wouldn't be problems. I didn't say there wouldn't be failure. I didn't say there wouldn't be trials. I didn't say there wouldn't be opposition. But now I am. You know why? Because in spite of me, 
Jesus loves me. In spite of me, he cares for me. Do you, do, you, do, you, do, you think, do you think that I think in the wildest and longest day that I live that I'm qualified to stand here in this pulpit? I feel so unqualified all the time. No college, no seminary, no education. And, and nobody, when I was younger, speaking into my life. And when I got saved, I was a wild preacher. I used to be a wild preacher. And when I was young, man... And preachers that make fun of me and, and belittle me. It's not been easy. The Christian life's not been easy for me. And then my failure on top of that. And then be invited by a great man of God to a great church and ministry like this. I say at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. And the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight. Lord, I'm so sorry. I've disappointed you so many times. I've grieved the Holy Spirit so many times. I said to Billy just recently, honey, I hope you're there when I take my last dying breath. I want to be able to say, thank God the battle's almost over. But I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to give way. Why? Because he died for me in my place because of me. And now I am happy all the day. One last word. Don't forget about the so that's of life. D don't forget about the so that's of life. You, you, you know why... God took what the enemy meant for evil in my life and turned it for our good so that we could help other people. You know why God has blessed you so much? So that you could help others. You know why he encouraged you in the midnight hours? So that you could encourage others. You know why, girls, he's done for you what he's done for you? So that you could go to somebody else and say there's hope. Everything God has done for us is so that so that we can help other people, encourage other people, bless other people, carry the gospel to other people, give to other people, make a difference in their life, add value to them, serve them. He's done it so that we can do that. Now hear me. If we forget about the so that's of life, one day we'll come to the end of our life and people look at our church, look at our life, look at our ministry, look at our marriage, look at our whatever, and say, so what? So what? They got saved. They never told me about Jesus. So what? They were blessed. They never came and blessed me. So what? They were encouraged. They never encouraged me. So what? They failed. They never came and told me there was hope. And, and if we don't remember the so that's of life, one day when people look at our life after we're gone, they'll say, so what? You're making a difference. I love you. I love you, Mike. I cannot tell you what that drive up to Hendersonville meant to me. I cannot tell you what standing in that little church over there with three, four hundred people weeping in the pulpit and you in spite of opposition saying, I want you to come. I love you. I I don't get to do about one or two churches like this a year. I just can't anymore. I'm so busy. And when Mike said, would you come? I said, oh my gosh, would I come? I'd do anything for you and anything for that church. But all that you've heard over the last month, all that you've heard over the last month, can I, can I, can I just encourage you tonight? We're going to have an invitation. And I want to encourage you tonight. If you're here without Jesus Christ, if you've never been saved by the grace of God, I want you to hear me. You're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. For God so loved the world, he loved you, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Christ died in your place for you and because of you. For by grace you're saved, through faith, that not of yourself, it's a gift of God. 
it, it not of works that stand man should boast. Brother, if I held this gift, this handkerchief out to you and said, this is my gift to you, what do you have to do to make it yours? Take it. Receive it. For as many as received him, to him that gave the power to become the sons of God. Christ died in your place if you're here without him. And I don't care what your age is. If you're a child of God, born again, saved by grace, a member of this church or a visitor, I want us to come together. Matthew, I don't know what you have planned for the invitation, but I want us to come together down to the altar and say, God, we, we, need, we, need the, we need fresh wind and fresh fire in our hearts and our lives. We need for you to do something for us because there's a battle out there that's raging and we're the front line against the enemy. We, we, want, to, we want to join together like never before. We want to be everything that you have called us to be and, and realize we're not going to sit still here till we die. If we get up by faith and head, no matter what the opposition seems to be, no matter how insurmountable it seems to be, if God's for you, who can be against you? And so we're going to stand in a moment and sing. And when we do, I'm asking you, would you just, by faith, make a choice? I'm going to be here with you. You know why? Because I always need that fresh work of grace in my heart and in my life. I heard one of your preachers say during this month, he said, how was the last time you came to the altar? You know, what I, you know what I thought about when he said that? I've never said in a church service ever that I didn't hit the altar. The first thing, the invitation was given. Why? Because I know God wants to do something in me continually. So let's stand together right now. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Matthew, we're going to sing in a moment. I want to pray first. And, and, and after I pray and we begin to sing, would you just come and join me, Pastor Mike? I want Pastor Mike to end this series of meetings with, with, a, with a prayer tonight, a prayer that we'll be the army that God called us to be. And, and, and realize that without God, we cannot but without us, God will not. Heavenly Father, I pray over this blessed church that the Holy Spirit of God will perform a miracle of grace in our hearts and our lives and do for us what we can do for ourselves. If there's people here without Christ that have never been saved, never been born again, I pray that they'll right now, like those four leprous men, just trust that you have provision for them at the cross, provision for them at Calvary in your shed blood. And then, Father, for all these wonderful saints of God at First Baptist and even the visitors, I pray that we'll gather at the altar and just say, God, breathe on me afresh and anew. I'm not too old. I still have life in me and I still have a ministry before me and usefulness to the kingdom of God and I want to be a good soldier. And so, Father, I pray in Jesus' name you'll draw hearts to yourself. And for that, what you do, we thank you for it in Christ's name we pray.